A place called Perfect, Chapter 31, The Reunion. We'll be fine, Jack piped up on behalf of the orphans. He was looking straight at William. We know how to avoid the watchers and how to get them worked up. I'll go back to the orphanage and get more recruits. I bet we can cause enough trouble between us to make the watchers believe there really is an uprising. I'd love to see their faces if they realised it was only an uprising of kids, Violet smiled. We'll make it look like the no man's landers are plotting something. You know, we'll run up and down the streets carrying things, breaking windows, causing mayhem and stuff. We'll keep the watchers busy at the far end of no man's land while you lot sneak over to the wall to Iris's. And you think you'll be okay? William asked, looking Jack in the eye. We'll be fine, he said confidently. We'll keep them distracted for as long as we can. It'll be fun. They all discussed the plan at length. It was decided that orphans would start causing trouble on the streets of No Man's Land first. Once the Watchers had their hands full, Boy, Violet, William, Merrill and two of the orphans, Anna and Billy Jr., would set off for Perfect. As dawn was approaching, Jack led the rest of the orphans back to the orphanage to round up more volunteers to start their revolt. William and Merrill readied the Reimaginator for its journey covering it with a blanket while Boy packed a pillowcase with two specific imaginations and a, protect and a protection of soft stuffing. Once ready, the group of six snuck from Merrill's toy shop. Violet's heart pounded as they turned off the lane onto Forgotten Road. She kept checking over her shoulder, sure they'd be caught, but as Jack had promised, the watchers were busy at the other end of town. Noise was gradually filling the streets of No Man's Land. She could hear glass breaking and doors banging in the distance. She relaxed a little as they reached the run-down house that Boy used to access the rooftops of No Man's Land. They climbed the rickety stairs until they were all squashed inside the slime green bathroom. We've got to go out there, Boy said, pointing to the window. Across the rooftops? Merrily asked. Merrill asked warily. Boy nodded as William played with the latch on the window. It's not big enough to fit the machine through, he said, turning to the group. We'll have to knock the window out. Violet stood back, shielding the orphans, as Boy, William and Merrill began to push hard on the frame. Eventually, the wood splintered and cracked until it finally gave way under their assault. Boy climbed out first, followed by William. Then Merrill gently guided the reimaginator to them as they waited on the slates. He then climbed out to join them. Violet helped the orphans out and, on Boy's instructions, they all clambered across the rooftops to the wall. Boy quickly grabbed the rope wrapped it around the pillowcase of jars and lowered them down the wall to the ground. Then he nimbly jumped over the edge and climbed down. He untied the pillowcase and threw the rope back up so Violet and the two orphans could descend. Once they were down, William and Merrill lifted the reimaginator, secured it to the rope and slowly lowered the machine to the ground. Boy and Violet guided it to safety. Lastly, Merrill, then William, lowered themselves down. All a little shaky, they rested by the wall for a moment before checking the coast was clear. Then they headed up Archer's Avenue to Iris's house. Even in the dim dawn light, it was easy to tell William was nervous. Setting down the machine, he turned his back to the group and walked to the door. The others hid in the early morning shadows by the wall. His hand shook as he raised it to knock on the painted wood. Violet's stomach fluttered, but nothing happened. William waited for a while, then knocked again. The click of the latch was magnified in the quiet of the street. Light fell onto the cobbled road, and William's face was illuminated by the opened door. 
A tiny heart-wrenching yelp flew from Iris and her son's tense stance softened in the swiftness of his mother's embrace. Violet's eyes filled with tears. Iris Archer held her son for what seemed an eternity. The others eyed the road nervously, hoping the watchers would not patrol by. Ma'am, William said, eventually stepping back, we need your help. Oh, I knew something was brewing, William, Iris smiled and invited her ragged guests inside. Surprisingly, she greeted them all by name. Maybe Iris wasn't as mad as everyone said. I knew you'd do something, Violet, the old woman winked, pouring her a glass of water. I saw it in your eyes and you have a touch of mischief about you. Violet smiled, taking the comment as a compliment. I want to thank all of you, Iris said, grabbing her son's hand, for bringing William back to me. I'm so sorry, ma'am, William stuttered, still shaken. I should have come to see you sooner, but I couldn't. I know, Iris replied softly. The room fell into a sombre silence. I knew you'd come back one day, the old woman spoke again, breaking the quiet. You have the fight, a spirit that can't be dulled and never fully dies. They have macula, William blurted as though he couldn't hold on to the words. They told me she was dead and it almost killed me. I couldn't bear to try and be happy again, so I gave up the fight. I'm so sorry, ma'am. I should have come to you. I just thought it would be better if everyone, if, for everyone if I stayed away. It's okay, William. You're back now. That's all that matters. Iris looked out past the faces at her table into a place only she could go. So, they took Macula, she said moments later. I wondered about that. They robbed my life from me, those two terrible two. I saw a little of it in them when they were young. They took after their father, but who can predict this of their sons? She looked into William's eyes. When you disappeared and then Macula soon after, George and Edward told me you'd both died. I tried not to believe them. I didn't feel it here, you see she said, pointing to her heart. But part of me died too after that. She looked down at her hands clasped tightly around a glass of water, the white of her knuckles showing strain. I live outside your brother's rules here. They allow me that much. I don't wear their glasses or drink their tea. Sometimes I think it might be easier if they took my imagination. At least then I wouldn't have to live with this guilt. She looked down, ashamed. What guilt, ma'am? This is not your fault, William said, concerned. It is my fault, William. What George and Edward became, it's all my fault. I loved you too much. I protected you too fiercely when you were young. I had, I had to, but it made them jealous. It was hard on your brothers. I'm a bad mother. No, you're a great mother, William said, reaching for Iris's hand and squeezing it. They sat together in silence. Violet looked at Boy. Somehow it felt wrong to be there. We can stop them, ma'am. That's why we're here, William continued. We can change perfect. We can take back our town. He pulled the blanket from the reimaginator. This will give people their imaginations back, ma'am. Iris stood up and seemed stronger, like she'd come back to herself. She walked slowly around the machine, asking questions of her son, questions Violet found impossible to understand. It was easy to see where the archers got their brains. I used to think she was a bit loony, Violet whispered to Boy. You get away with a lot of a lot when people think you're a bit mad, Violet, Iris winked. Boy laughed as Violet blushed at the deep red. 
Once Iris had fully inspected the machine, they began to fill her in on the plan. We have Billy Bobbins and Madeline Nunn's imaginations here, Boy said, passing the jars to Iris to inspect. They live at the top of this street. I live two doors from Billy, Anna said, stepping forward. Well, I mean my man does. I used to. I remember you, pet, Iris replied, pulling the little girl onto her knee. Anna Nunn. They took you about a year ago, didn't they? The girl nodded and began to cry. We're hoping their families will be able to see them now, Violet said. We put William's potion into the archer's tea. Everyone will be drinking it this morning and if it works they'll be able to see again. They won't recognise no man's landers straight away, though not until we give them back their imaginations. Then Mum will know me, you promised, Anna said looking straight at Boy. Can you bring Madeline and Billy here? William asked Iris. Then we can zap them with the reimaginator. They'll recognise their children, they'll believe us and join the revolution, Iris smiled. Exactly, William replied. Then we'll bring them to no man's land to convince the people there and build an army. I'll try my best, Iris said, but people around here think I'm mad. I haven't spoken to either of them in as long as I can remember. I can't see how they'll follow me. Tell them that Edward and George want to meet them, Boy said suddenly. I bet they'll come here for that. Everybody loves the archers and people in Perfect believe anything you tell them. They discussed the plan as Iris made everyone breakfast. When it was decided sufficient time had passed for all of Perfect to have consumed their first brew of the new tea, Iris left her home on a mission. Make sure they take off their glasses, ma'am, William called after her. That way they'll be able to see us when they come in. William and Merrill lifted the reimaginator so it sat on the table in the centre of the room. Boy and Violet took the jars and gently opening the lids eased the contents into the glass box in the middle of William's machine. The imaginations floated through the space and swirled together. Won't they get mixed up? Violet asked, pulling on William's short shirt sleeve. No, Violet, look. He smiled, pointing at the glass. The imaginations had settled one on top of the other, like oil and water. No two people think alike. Suddenly there were voices in the street outside. Really? They want to speak to us? A man said, obviously delighted. I knew Edward loved my Victoria sponge at the children's cake sale, a woman was saying. I saw it on his face. He won't mind me calling him Edward, will he, now that we're friends? No, of course not, Madeline, Iris replied. Now, I must ask you both to take off your glasses inside my home. They don't go with the decor, you see. Oh, Madeline said, but we won't be able to see. Nonsense, Iris sighed. Didn't you hear the wonderful news? That new doctor has fixed the problem with perfect. Everyone can see again without their specs. Oh, wonderful, Madeline smiled. I knew he'd do great things. His wife is a gem. Lovely lady, Billy said, nodding his head. The pair removed their glasses as Iris turned the key. Oh, you have guests, Billy said, looking around her kitchen. Oh yes, they are... Daddy! Billy Jr. cried, running towards Billy. Boy grabbed his shirt, pulling him back and held on tightly to the struggling seven-year-old. We're, um, Iris's cousins, William said quickly, covering the situation. Oh, how nice, Madeline replied. Where are you visiting from? Timbuktu, Violet piped up. Don't I know you, dear? Madeline said, looking at Violet. Oh no, I look like lots of people. 
one of those faces. I've heard Timbuktu is lovely, Billy interrupted. Would anyone like tea? Iris asked, switching on the kettle. Oh, I'd love some, Iris, Madeline replied. Ours just isn't tasting the same this morning. Boy winked at Violet. So where are Mr Archer and Mr Archer? Billy asked, looking about the room. Oh, they're, um, they're upstairs. They'll be down in a minute, William responded. While we wait, would you mind terribly if we took a family portrait? It's for our holiday snaps. The kids are growing so quickly. Of course, Madeline replied. I know what, what that's like. My youngest is almost eight. No, I'm not. That's my sister. I'm only six, Anna sniffled in the corner. Oh, you're just a little younger than mine then, Madeline smiled. OK, Billy, you sit here and Madeline, you here, William said, placing their chairs just in front of the reimaginator. But we're not part of your family, Billy replied. Oh, you are. We're all cousins. How could you forget our family reunion in Timbuktu? William smiled. But I've never been to Timbuktu. Madeline replied, taking a seat in front of the machine. Yes, you have, Violet, can, Violet said. Don't you remember? We went swimming with the turtles and you said you thought they were lovely. And then we went for a drive on the beach and we saw a giant elephant and you said... Boy dug Violet with his elbow to stop her rambling. You don't need to make up such a big story, he whispered. Maybe I do remember, Madeline piped up, looking curiously at Violet. I do love turtles. So do I, Violet said. See, we are cousins. That's a funny looking camera, Billy said. It's the latest thing, Boy replied. Everyone has them in Timbuktu. Right, William said loudly. Everybody say cheese. He pulled the cord on the reimaginator and the machine sprang to life. Each of the bagpipe lungs began inflating and deflating at great speed. Suddenly the two imaginations were sucked from the glass centre into separate pipes. The machine pulled in its lungs as if taking a deep breath and with an almighty sound like a huge sneeze, they spat out the imaginations. The greenish one flew to Billy Bobbin's nose and the brownish one to Madeline Nunn's. The pair sat frozen in terror as the separate strains of coloured gas shot up their nostrils. Immediately their eyes shut and their heads fell forward. Billy slipped right down onto the floor while Madeline slumped to the side, resting her head on the table. Will Mum be okay? Anna stuttered, grabbing Violet's hand. Suddenly, both Madeline and Billy began to snore. What's happening? Violet asked William, trying not to sound anxious. I'm not sure, Violet, he answered with a smile. I've never been able to test the machine properly before with real subjects, but I trust the science. Billy and Madeline are simply readjusting. The imagination is at its strongest when we're asleep. That's why dreams are so real. Their brains are simply rebooting. It's a wondrous thing, the human body. The snoring stopped as quickly as it had started and both Billy and Madeline suddenly opened their eyes. Where am I? Madeline asked, sitting upright. What happened? Mum! Anna said, jumping from her seat and running to her mother's side. Anna? Anna, is that you? Madeline cried, wrapping the little girl up in her arms. I thought, I thought, I don't know what I thought. Billy's son threw himself in onto his father's groggy body and they shared a tearful embrace. After a while, William helped Billy up from the floor and everyone came together round the kitchen table. Both Madeline and Billy had a world of questions. 
So it was the tea, the stuff I fed my family every day and night that made us blind? Madeline cried, hugging her daughter close. And these things, these glasses robbed our minds? Billy said, about to crush them in his palm. Oh, I wouldn't do that, Billy, William said, looking at his fist. You may need those to blend in. The watchers might notice if they see you without them. So everything, everything we've believed for years has been a lie. Billy stood up from the table. William nodded and filled them in on all that had really been happening in their town. Their anger towards the Archer twins was obvious and it didn't take much to convince them both to come on board. So, what do you need us to do? Madeline asked. Well, we're trying to build an army, William said. We need you to come with us to No Man's Land to show everyone that our plan works. If they know there's a way to get families back, the people of No Man's Land will fight. And what about the perfectionists? Billy asked. The more of us you can change here, the more people you'll have on your side, right? William looked at Boy and Violet, then over at Merrill. We could bring some more imaginations and change people here at Iris's, Boy said. Yes, it is working well, William replied more to himself than anyone. So maybe we should just keep going as long as we don't arouse suspicion. I could get more people to come here, Madeline spoke up. I'm on almost every committee in town. I know everyone. The watchers won't suspect a thing if I'm seen socialising on our streets. Some days all I ever do is drink tea and gossip. And I'll go over to no man's land if you can arrange a meeting, Billy added. At least none of at least some of the no man's landers will know me and they'll see my story is true. I'm sure I can convince people to joining the uprising. Sounds like a plan, Boy said. I'll take you into no man's land and then I'll come back here with some more orphans and their jars. I'm coming with you, Boy, Violet said. I'm not standing around here doing nothing. Merrill looked at Billy. I'll go too. I'll be your best shot for setting up the meeting. The no man's landers think the rest of us and the rest of you are mad. He laughed, glancing around at his companions. Maybe we should start getting the rest of the imaginations from the twins' storeroom too, William added. Can you organise some orphans to do that, boy? Just so they're safe? If my brothers get wind of our plot, they'll hide them all and we might never find the imaginations again. Boy nodded. Lunchtime was approaching as Madeline Nunn left Iris's, Iris Archer's house, heading for Edward Street. Boy, Violet, Merrill, Billy and his son left too, heading for the wall into no man's land. Each had a task to do. William, Iris and Anna remained behind. Anna sat on Iris's knee and as the old lady told her stories of Adequate, the town that used to be, William beat an incessant path to the window, watching the avenue for signs of trouble. And that's the end of chapter 31.